We're riding on with Lola to the Godland and running a ruse de guerre on the Mario Brothers. I'm Van Connor. And I'm Adam Ball, and this is Off Screen, your seven day guide to everything movies. Boom. Hello and welcome back to the podcast. So, okay, uh, we've got loads of new movies to talk about this week, as we always do. Um, We're going to start, I I will just say now, I know nothing about any of them this week. So uh, it's all going to be a surprise to me, Van. Let's start with Ride On, which is in cinemas from today. Right, so Ride On, which is the new movie, uh, it's the new Jackie Chan movie. Uh, That's what this is. Jackie Chan Ah. plays a stuntman. Of the age of Jackie Chan, who I believe is now 70 years old. I think Whoa. Jackie Chan is now 70, which is incredible, isn't it? I mean, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, Jackie Chan stays relatively free. He's looked the exact same age for about 30 years. Like, he's not looked young for the last 30 years, but he has stayed relatively crystallized. Uh, he's a sort of washed-up washed up stuntman, bit of a recluse, kind of a deadbeat dad. Lives in a sort of shack-like structure that he's built for himself, which also doubles as a sort of stunt training course. And he lives alone with his treasured horse, a stunt horse named Red Hair. And he starts to to find his way, sort of gets his second wind, finds his way sort of ascending back in, making a bit of a comeback after decades of being washed up, numerous injuries, things like that. Becomes a bit of a viral sensation when the debt collectors come round and then he does the whole Jackie Chan, you know, Wuxia action thing where he's back. Yeah. You know, when he's, when he's, you know, knocking guys out with napkins and things like that because he's Jackie Chan. And it starts to help his career. And he starts to reconnect with his daughter. He starts to form a, a budding friendship with his daughter's fiance, who also doubles as a, as, a, as a solicitor, helping him with his legal troubles. As these debt collectors start to circle or attempting to take his beloved horse, Red Hair, away from him. We've not got a clip for this one because obviously it, it's an entirely subtitled film. This is most definitely not what you would assume a Jackie Chan movie would be in this day and age. For one thing, it's not an action movie. It's what I would describe as a kind of a familial drama more than anything else. It is a sort of family drama. It's, it's quite cutesy. It's, it skews quite young. It's written and directed by Larry Yang. It's a bit long, this one. It's two hours and six minutes long. And it, it, it does feel a bit baggy. Because like I say, it's a Jackie Chan movie that's largely dialogue-based. Yeah, and you know it's a subtitled movie. It's entirely you know dialogue and emotion, but of course you get the occasional bit of stunt work with Jackie Chan. So you constantly feel like you're being pulled in that other direction. However, it's a Jackie Chan movie, so therefore it's charming AF. You know what I mean? Like Jackie Chan never fails to deliver on you know on that front. He was manages to bring a bit of that 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 cheek and heart that he has just in spades. You know, because he's Jackie Chan. Uh, also. This has just the most charming horse you will ever encounter in a movie. Like, I'm, I'm not going to do that. Like, I don't read too much into this spoiler-wise from what I'm about to say, because it, it doesn't mean what you think it means. I wept like a baby at the end of this. Wow. Like, just buckets, buckets of tears by the end of this. I was broken at the end of this. No, don't think that means the ending you think it does or anything like that. It's a very sweet movie. It's a very sincere movie. I'm just pulling up my, my notes here. And it's it's just chock full of these just wonderful little moments. There is a sequence in this that's going to haunt my nightmares. Just a moment in it in which Jackie Chan, with his horse, stood behind him, facing in the same direction, literally has his horse lift his front legs, grabs a hold of those legs, and just backflips and kicks a dude. In a way that I didn't even actually know was physically possible of a human being. And you're like, yeah, then again, it's Jackie Chan, isn't it? So I shouldn't be too surprised. Um, The man just doesn't skip a beat. Having said that, there is something, there is something of a pathos as regards, you know, separating the art from the artist in this case, because, you know, you're talking about you know an aging stuntman, it's a movie about an aging stuntman, it's Jackie Chan who is, you know, known to be doing less action stuff here than he does, you know, elsewhere. You're not getting your Shanghai Noon or Rush Hour level Jackie Chan in this. So you are getting familial drama Jackie Chan with occasional action. And, and see, the meta-narrative there of, you know, Jackie Chan, of all people, playing this character, 
is actually quite profound. It works on several levels. And I think there's enough that he seems to be able to connect to in the material that you get a really great performance out. And I said, obviously, I don't speak Mandarin, so you know, he could be flubbing his lines for all I know. I don't know. But in terms of the sincerity, the heart, the soul, and the nuance, what's, you know, it, it, the interpersonal nuances that he brings to it, I, I feel like this is a really solid movie. Like I say, bags of tears by the end. I laughed a fair few times. Um, that 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 shtick with the uh, with with the horse's legs. Like I say, it's just going to haunt my nightmares now because I just didn't think it was possible. And I was really charmed by this. I think um, if 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 you could get a young child, for instance, to bite to get through the the barrier of the subtitles, I, I think this is something the whole family could sit and watch and enjoy. I mean, even to you know, quite young children, because it's quite a, you know, it's a bloodless film. It's very family friendly. There's no age rating anywhere for this. Oh, there is a PG. There you go. I, I, I found one. There you go. There's not one on IMDb, but I found one. Um, it's a PG, and it does have that feel about it. Like I say, this kind of bloodless. It's not a particularly aggressive movie. It, it deals with violence in that that quintessentially Jackie Chan way. You know, like you wouldn't just language aside and certain you know problematic racial elements. You look at how he is in, in Rush Hour, for instance, and that kind of material. Jackie Chan doesn't really go for the hard R stuff. You know what I mean? Like, it's, he's not a snapping necks dude. Yeah, you know, he, yeah. He's more an I'll give you a comedic slap and knock you out that way from exhaustion kind of thing. And you're getting that here. That's very much the performance and, and, and the sort of level this operates on. Um, like I say, you are just going to be won over by this. I was I was really sold. I, I gave this four stars. I regret nothing. The only reason I didn't give it five was because I just thought the runtime is a little baggy. It, it, it does feel a little bit drawn out. And I think you could clip maybe 25 minutes out of this, get this down to 100 minutes. And I think you've got a very winning movie there all around. I think you have got a five-star film at 100 minutes. There's a similar caveat I'm going to give to another film later, which we do this. Um, However, that that being said, I, I also really enjoy. I, I really liked the uh, the action choreography and the styling of this. There is a very fun whip zip kind of a mentality to this, but at the same time, there is there's a lot of uh, imagination put to kind of how they delve into flashbacks and things like that. And a very cute sequence in which they actually use old Jackie Chan movies, you know, things like Police Story stuff like that as the backstory for his character. So young Jackie Chan does double as his own character's younger self in this. You see Jackie Chan doing his stunts when he's like 25, and it's meant to be his character here. And I, I, like I say, I was really, really won over by this. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Jackie Chan fan. I'm, I'm a Chan fan anyway, you know me. But um, I, I, it won me. It really did. I was solidly charmed by it. Bags of tears. Winning all round for me, just maybe not on that runtime. So that's... that's Do you really think do you think there's scope for a for a sequel off the back of this? What, right off? No. No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Although, if you had that, the box set was right on, right off. It's very Karate Kid, isn't it? A movie, yeah. A movie he himself remade, like, ten years ago. Remember, remember that god-awful remake? Yeah. Nowhere near as good as the original. <sighs> Totally well, I mean, agree. Fundament fundamentally flawed, given they weren't doing karate, they were doing kung fu, which is a very, very different art. But, you know, yeah. Jaden yeah. needed the work, evidently, and Will can only produce so many films at a time. But, yeah, so right on, though, I, I wholeheartedly recommend this. Like, it's out in cinemas from today. I think it's limited release. But if you can seek it out, do, and you won't regret it. Like I say, 20 minutes too long, maybe, but four-star fun for me. I was just really one by it. If I didn't have a thing against subtitled movies purely because I can't concentrate on them, you you would have sold that to me from from how you've explained hey, what it's like. We know? are going to watch the raid together one of these days. You, know? <laughs> you and me, we are going to watch the raid. You were going to watch the greatest action movie of the twenty first century. I'm not I'm not exaggerating when I say that. It is, and and the fact that it's sub there is a dubbed version incidentally, but the dub is terrible. So you know, subs not dubs. That's the rule. Always up for a challenge, fan. You know that. I'll be willing to give it a go. Um, all right. Well, that's, uh, as you said, right on in cinemas from today. Um, stay right where you are because we're going to talk about Godland and also something I know Van is excited to talk about, Lola, in just a minute. So stay right where you are. We'll be back. <laughs> 
Hello and welcome back. So we've got a couple of uh, a couple of new movies to talk about now. We're going to talk about Lola in a second. But we're going to start with Godland. And as I uh, mentioned at the start of this podcast, uh, I haven't got any prep on any of these today. So literally, I'm going in completely blind, Van. What's Godland about? So Godland, uh, new movie uh, written and directed by uh, Hilnir Palmason. Um, I think it's uh, Iceland. It's an Icelandic Danish uh, story. So it's about a 19th century Danish priest named Lucas, who is dispatched to Iceland, which at this point in the 19th century is still a Danish colony. Uh, he is dispatched to you know the remote, remotest possible region they can possibly send him uh, to construct a church, to, to oversee and and be, you know get heavily basically run the construction of a church for you know this region. And as he as he makes the trek, he, he finds himself faced with the harshness not only of the journey but just life in the wilderness. Finds himself literally staring into the literal and spiritual abyss, and also finds his baser instincts maybe more powerful than he at first would have suspected yeah this one's uh, this one this one's quite a bleak somber drama and also quite quite long so this was 2 hours and 23 minutes long oh. in, entire, in, entirely subtitled in not one but two languages in both danish and and, and icelandic and uh, because it's an actual plot point that there are two languages there. He, Lucas right. himself doesn't speak Icelandic. Um, he has uh, a guide, Ragnar, who, uh, do, who doesn't speak Danish, and they have a bit of a culture clash based on this. He enters into a relationship with the daughter of a, a farmer who takes him in, and this causes problems. And, and this animosity between Ragnar and, uh, and Lucas built and built and built, it is, as I say, just bleak. It is a really somber, downbeat, bleak of a drama. Um, it's one of those films that you do you do sit there and think, if you were the kind of if, if you're the kind of person that is actively going to seek out a near two and a half hour entirely subtitled drama about a 19th century priest, you're probably going to be the kind of person for whom this is going to fly. Mm. Me, I kind of sit in the middle of do or die on this one. Like it's it's fine. For me, I mean, I, I didn't quite gel with it. I found myself quite detached from it. But I will say that the, uh, the central performance, and his name is uh, Elliot Crosset Hove, uh, as Lucas, I think it's absolutely brilliant. And um, his rivalry with uh, Ingmar, uh, Ingmar Signerson, let's say, Ingmar Signerson as Ragnar, uh, the, animos I say, the animosity that builds it, it's palpable. You do feel it. And it, you feel like you're you're kind of just waiting on a countdown for these two to start bashing each other's heads in. Um, in a sense, that does come. Maybe not quite the way you expect. This is a movie, incidentally, that also involves, just tangentially involves a volcano. That That's something I have to bring in. And I did find myself thinking once or twice of Martin Scorsese's forgotten, I want to say, 2016 uh, drama Silence with uh, Adam Driver and Liam Neeson. That that popped into my head once or twice. It might have just been because of how bleak this was and the fact that it involved priests. But kind of a limited field on that one. It sounds utterly boring to me, if I'm honest. I mean, it's not I something I would go and it. see. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think you'd enjoy this one, to be honest, Adam. Definitely don't use this as a date movie, whatever you do. Or, or, or unless you meet the right girl, in which case, you know, maybe if she's into that, by all means. Um, but I say, I think if you are, if you like a good slow burn art house drama, foreign language subtitled art house drama, I think there's something there. That, like, there's some great cinematography, the atmosphere. I think I found, I found the, the I found it quite immersive in that sense. The atmosphere I, I found more effective than the actual film itself. Like, I did feel myself quite taken in by just how palpably cold you know it felt. Like, you you felt like you know that feeling. You know when you when you watch a really good movie that's set on like you know frosty hills where you yeah. can, where the mist is in the air and you you can feel how crisp. And chilly that mist really is against your skin. Like you, you have that through this, but I just didn't quite find myself as taken in by the performances I wanted to be, which I think is a shame. Well, there we go. If you want to make your own mind up, Godland is in cinemas and uh, on Curzon at home from today. Now, the big one you want to talk about this afternoon, this evening, mm -hmm. whatever time of day you're listening to this podcast, in the bath, in the shower, wherever. You and, is... you and your bath. Why do you, want every, you want everyone to be naked and covered in water for some reason all the time. I don't know what it is. 
Well, it would, doesn't everybody? Um, so, Lola. <laughs> Lola. Talk so, to Lola. me about Lola. New movie directed by and co-written uh, by uh, Andrew Leggy. I think it's his feature debut, actually. Um, relatively low-budget film, but, oh, my God, masterclass in uh, in, in lean, efficient, low-budget filmmaking. Like, I, I, I had to pitch this to my, my former college lecturer as, like, you, you need to show the kids this, because, like, this is something you can do relatively easily, and it's so well done. So... 1941 set found footage time travel drama. That's what this is. Oh, I love that. Yeah. Okay. Oh, good. It's, it's, uh, Tom and Mars. So I think it's Martha and Thomasina. Played by uh, Stephanie Martini, I think. I'm going to list here. Uh, Stephanie Martini and Emma Appleton. They have mm-hmm. an invention machine named Lola. Lola allows them, and bear in mind, this is, I think they start this in 1938. 1938, they put this machine together, and it allows them to receive radio and television signals from the future. They immediately use this to earn a profit. So think back to the future too and the almanac, right? Yeah, so what yeah. Marty was implying with the almanac and what Biff actually went and did in Back to the Future 2. So they start using it to, to make a quick buck, and then they quickly discover that, you know, a couple of years down the line, evidently something bad is about to happen. And given that they start doing this in 1938, you can probably imagine what that might be. Any guesses? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, World War II is a Bruin. Yeah. And they've got the inside scoop. So, what happens is they become collect between the two of them, they become a, a sort of a, a folk hero known as the Angel of Portobello. They go on the radio with full knowledge of where the Germans are about to bomb, and they warn people to, to flee, to get out of there. So basically, they bypass the Blitz. The Germans actually give up on the Blitz. However, although that's a good thing in the short term, it does have longer-term consequences that they aren't quite prepared for that may, in fact, bring about the end of the world. And even worse than that, the end of a certain pop star that, well, you and I and a lot of people are very fond of. Have a listen. But Lola didn't just show us the world's wonders. She also showed us its horrors. The Nazis had torn through Europe. Paris had fallen... Dunkirk had been evacuated, and now Hitler had set his sights on Britain. The Blitz would claim thousands of lives over the coming months. Lola could no longer be just ours. Well, this sounds incredible. Clearly they didn't watch Back to the Future 2, though, because they would know that any changing of of past and future can always lead to worse consequences than what they've been changing, which evidently proves the point here. You know what? Before they get to it, because it's a lot, it's a bit of a while in the movie before they get to you know causality and the changes in the timeline. I've literally got in my notes, hey, honey, you may want to check out the grandfather paradox at some point, um, because time travel is a, a dicey minefield, especially if you're basically versed in astrophysics. Um, right, I love this. It's only seventy nine minutes long. It is a resoundingly short. It's an hour and 19 minutes long. And it's absolutely brilliant. This is five star brilliant. Like I say, found footage. So it's, you know, kind of like Cloverfield. You know, you're watching it through a camcorder kind of thing. But it's old timey film reel. So what they've done is they have gone and they can literally use an iPhone to do this if they want to. They haven't. They've actually gone and used period specific cameras, evidently. But. What if you film any anything? You, you de-age it in you know, editing software, effectively. You can use any old effects you like, and it looks completely convincing. There is a shot in this movie that blew my mind, and it is a shot of Adolf Hitler in an open-top car driving past Covent Garden tube station. And it looks absolutely seamless. And I'm just like, wow. this is not an expensive movie. How have you done this? Performances, great. Um, I'm going to overlook the fact that they had to kill David Bowie to do this, but... Uh, yeah. Got it. Just any, yeah, any other... But I, I do kind of like that David Bowie becomes the, the cultural touchstone for the 20th century, which is an actual thing they do in this. 
really well done. Resoundingly brilliant. I, I have nothing but incredible things to say about this movie. I don't want to spoil too much for you, but it is a, quite a, you know, a, a nice, tightly put together, almost Black Mirror episode. Like you could you could see this having been done as a Black Mirror special kind of thing. Yeah. Um, I think it's a hell of a calling card for its director. I think Andrew Leggett's got just a hell of a future doing something like this. This is an absolute like stand up look at me moment. I, I think the performances by uh, Martini and Appleton as well I think are, are great. I keep Every time I say Emma Appleton, I think, is she one of the sisters? No, she's not. She's a different Appleton. I, was it Not Natalie a member of Appleton? All Saints. Who, who are the Appletons in All Saints? It was Natalie and there was another one. Because the other yeah. one was married to Liam Gallagher, wasn't she? Yeah, that's right. I can't remember their yeah. flipping names now. But yeah, the Appleton Ooh. sisters, because they started a group together when they left All Saints, etc. Yeah, yeah imaginatively right. enough, called Appleton, if memory serves. Uh, Correct. Their only, their only single to chart, again, if memory serves, was called Don't Worry. Weird, the things you remember from the 2000s. And that's right? how I met Liam Gallagher, because he came with her when I interviewed her. One of them. You git. Yeah. All right. I'm not saying uh, right. Um, <laughs> other thing I'm going to single out about this. There is, there are, there, there's a handful of really just incredible alternative timeline pop songs. When they change the future, we actually, because of the, the Lola machine, we get to see, like, top of the pops from an alternate timeline, like Man in the High Castle timeline. Brilliant. And, like, imagine a 70s pop song written, uh, written as propaganda for Nazi Britain. And that's wow. what you get here. It's, it's fantastic. This will blow your mind. It's called Lola. It's unlimited theatrical from today. If you come upon this and you get the chance to see it, regardless of how, just watch it. It's so, so good. I've got nothing but amazing things to say about it. I want to I want to see it again very badly. For which the second I find the time, I am going to watch it again. Like I can say, it's called Lola. Check it out. You will not regret it. You know me well. Anything to do with time travel, I'm there, and I will be watching this as soon as it is available. Um, all right. We are going to talk about uh, what would you probably... You would probably class as this week's big movie, actually, the Super Mario Brothers movie in a moment. Well, apparently, according to the uh, the opening box office, because this opened on Wednesday, according yeah. to its initial box office haul, there's a good chance this might be the big earner of the year. This might actually pull a Sonic the Hedgehog. Wow. Well, we'll find out what Van thinks of it in just a minute, so uh, stay where you are. Now it's time for a segment we like to call Off Screen Pays the Bills. Hey, Adam. Hey, Van, what's going on? Ain't hey, nothing going on but the rent. You know how it is. And, you know, thankfully, our rent's getting paid this week by the good people at HelloFresh. I'm very happy about this as well, because I actually am a big fan of HelloFresh. I have used HelloFresh for a long time. So this fills me with glee. And I've used HelloFresh and the sister company, Green Chef, as well. Because all these companies now offer, like, keto and low-carb options, which is, you know, right up my particular alley, because, you know, I'm, I, I'm like that. So um, have, you, have you ever used HelloFresh, Adam? Uh, no, no, no. I've have you used, have used any, any meal box? I don't name them, obviously, but have you used any meal box service? Uh, no, no. I, I know. No. I know the premise of what they are, what they do, right. um, which you know is interesting. Right. So HelloFresh, in this case, takes the hassle out of uh, out of meal time. You can take the hassle out of meal time by um, de they deliver boxes to your door with prepackaged portions of ingredients, easy and easy to prepare recipes that are on like recipe cards, provided recipe cards. They deliver them right to your door, so you can skip the supermarket checkout lines. No wasted afternoon in Tesco. And you can get outside in the summer weather all the quicker because HelloFresh have got you covered for dinner. I mean, I I'm a big fan, as I say. I've had some amazing meals out of them over the years. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm never going to stop ordering from meal boxes because, for one thing, there's, there's food waste and things like that. You, there's packaging, and it's just it's it's more environmentally conscious. It's uh, in terms of like you know. You buy a pack of chicken, for instance, you always want it with extra than what you need for the recipe, or mm. you know, you, you, you only need half the amount of cute. You get the exact right amount with HelloFresh. Like everything is portioned out for you. The recipes are straightforward, easy to follow. Like I, even you could do it, Adam, with your limited culinary experience. No experience required. Just follow the instructions on the card. They, I mean, it's it's illustrated so well as well. Like literally diagram. This is like a Lego set of instructions. You could put this together. 
which I said doddle, honestly. So you can spend less time in the kitchen as well. They have options like quick and easy that you like meals that you can make in like 10, 15 minutes. Um, things like uh, fast and fresh pineapple chicken tacos. It's so much variety. There's, there's options for everyone, every lifestyle. You can get vegan options, like say quick and easy. Um, you know, there's regular veggie, there's pescatarian, there's the health conscious options for like, you know, low carb for people like me. Yeah. Loads of options all the way around. Like I say, I, in terms of like my own experience, I don't know where to pick from because I, I just I go back like five six years <laughs> fresh now. Um, but this is the part that I really love. You can get fifty percent off your first box and free shipping thanks to us with the voucher code off screen fifty. You even get twenty percent off your following four boxes as well. It's like a weekly thing. You just get your box through and it's it's portioned out for the week. And you can have options like if you want so many meals for two people, you want so many meals for four people. And um, during COVID, for instance, it was it was when I was staying in the guest house at Mum's. That's how we would have a we would have it delivered, and we would have uh, it would just be for two of us. But we'd have four meals, and it always fell to me to bloody cook. But you know, cheers, cheers, <laughs> cheers, Mum. But like I say, you can go to HelloFresh.com, use the uh, voucher code OFFSCREEN50, or go to HelloFresh.com slash OFFSCREEN50, use that code, get 50% off your first box with free shipping, get 20% off the following four boxes as well. And you know what? You are going to eat like a king, sir. You really are. You're not going to regret it. You, 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 you can be spoiled. You're going to be absolutely spoiled. Like I say, I, the, the meals I have had over these years, I, honestly, I'm watering at the mouth now, actually, thinking about something like Better get in the kitchen, then. I better. I better. Do you know what? It's dinner time. I'm off. I'm, I'm, I'm going to get myself something. I'm going to get myself I, I, That's it. I've got recipes right now. I'm going to go and make myself something right now. That's my evening sorted. So, HelloFresh.com slash Offscreen50 or just go to HelloFresh.com and use the voucher code Offscreen50. Like we say, 50% off the first box, free shipping, 20% off the rest. All those options. So simple. So easy. So convenient. And the best part, you don't have to stand in line at Tesco anymore. What's not to love? So thanks to our good friends at HelloFresh. Hello and welcome back. Uh, right, a couple more new movies to talk about before the end. Uh, this one, on paper, is what you would have expected to have been this week's big one to talk about. Obviously, Lola in the last section, you were well up for and you thought was amazing. Oh, yeah. I'm hoping you're feeling the same about Super Mario Brothers movie. I actually have mostly positive. I, I know it's unusual for a film critic, evidently, to have good things to say about this movie. <laughs> right, I'm just going to say, because obviously, like I say, this opened on Wednesday. There are reviews out there from other critics. I'm not going to name names on this one, but it's 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 become very revealing this week to discover just who among my peers either had very tight parents or just very miserable childhoods. Like, very clearly. Um, I... I do not fall into that category, evidently. Um, I, I am a Game Boy enthusiast, as we established last week with uh, with Tetris. Yeah, you know me. I, I loved I loved my SNES. I never had a NES, but I was always I, you know I played a lot of NES when I was growing up. Kind of thing. My cousins had it. Um, I, I love my retro games. This is something I was very up for. So, it's from Illumination, the company that make uh, Despicable Me, Secret Life of Pets. They have taken on the, the the task of bringing the Super Mario Brothers to the screen in animated form this time. Um, this has happened before. We'll discuss that in a moment. And here you have the Mario Brothers, played by, uh, well, voiced by uh, Chris Pratt and Charlie Day. So Chris Pratt, we all know, is Star-Lord from Guardians of the Galaxy. You don't, because you've still not watched Guardians of the Galaxy, you so-and-so. I know, I know, I know. My life's just been too busy. Oh, <laughs> the, third, the trilogy's ending next month. <laughs> I know, I know. I've still got Star Wars to watch. Right, will you promise me that before we have to review Guardians of the Galaxy 3 together in a month's time, you will watch the, the two Guardians of the Galaxy movies? Yes, I, I will put them on. I will watch them. Right. If, if for no other reason than the soundtrack. But anyway, you've got Chris Pratt from Guardians of the Galaxy, you've got Charlie Day, best, best known really as Charlie from It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, which yeah. is kind of a personality he's bringing across this. So Pratt is Mario, Charlie Day is Luigi. They are brought into the Mushroom Kingdom, immediately separated. Luigi finds himself in the hands of King Bowser, uh, Bowser King of the Coopers because that, that's always been a bit of an ish, issue with like what is the name yeah. and uh, Mario has to team up with Princess Toadstool who in this iteration is sort of an ass kicking you know you know uh, monarch sort of an elected monarch to lead the Toadstool army and free his brother have a listen there's some fun to be had here my army Koopas Koopas 
Koopas! Whatever those things are! Aww. We will destroy the Mushroom Kingdom! Bowser is coming. I'm not afraid. I'll do anything for my brother. We're going to save him. Yes! Fire! <laughs> you asked for it! This is fun! So many questions, but so little time. Uh, you know, are there mushrooms that make him bigger? Are there stars where he runs around going, is Yoshi in here? Like, so many questions. Right. I'm going to take, the, take these as best I can. Right. Yes, there are mushrooms. Yes, there are stars. Yes, there are Yoshis. There's Mario Kart. There's Donkey Kong. There's yes. all sorts in this. Um, the only thing I can think of that's not in the movie is like Wario and Waluigi, which presumably is what they're saving for a sequel in the same way that Sonic saved Knuckles for that sequel. Yeah. And now, right, I loved this. I thought this was great. Like, I, It's 30 years this year since the last attempt to bring Super Mario Brothers to the screen. A movie so spectacularly terrible that Nintendo flat out gave up trying to make movies and declared that it was just a no-go, nobody was doing it, nobody could ever have the rights. 30 years would go by, Sonic the Hedgehog would become the highest grossing film of 2020, thanks to COVID, largely, admittedly. Um, actually, it's the second highest grossing film. I think it's the, is it the, the 800? There's a Chinese film called The 800 or something like that. That's the highest grossing film oh, of 2020. Didn't know that. But I think it's uh, the Sonic the Hedgehog was the second highest grossing film. And then immediately it was announced Mario was coming, to which the answer was, of course he is. Yeah. Right. Right, I'll go with the negatives first, of which there's only one. There is only one negative thing I can say about the Super Mario Brothers movie. Is it the length? No, it's not. Oh. It's Chris Pratt. Chris Pratt is the only negative thing about the Super... I'm, I'm trying to say Mario because that's how they say it in the movie. We say Mario. Yeah. And the Americans and you know, the Japanese seem to call him Mario and it's in the movie as Mario as if there's an H in there somewhere. I don't know why. Right, so... Pratt's voice in this just doesn't work. And it kind of sounds like he thinks he's playing Mario as a dork. Like, some sort of, like, dweeby dork. And there is a fish-out-of-water element to it, obviously, because, you know, he's a human being who's in the Mushroom Kingdom for the first time. It's the origin story of the Mario Brothers movie. No sooner has he got there, incidentally, than he's shown, oh, this is this is a training course we have, and it's literally a level from the Mario Brothers game. He has to go around <laughs> and, yeah. Complete with those platforms that fall out from under you after a second. Does, so you have to hop does he ever go down. down a drain pipe? Loads. Yeah. Loads of them. All the sound effects are there, as you can probably hear from the clip, like the woohoo and the power-ups and everything. There's a tanuki suit in there. There's all sorts. There's no frog suit. That one, I wanted the frog suit in there somewhere. Or, or the raccoon. I wanted the raccoon suit from Mario 3. Oh, that the but, one that made him fly, wasn't it? Yeah, well, that was the one, yeah, you did the run-up to, to the point where the, the pee started flashing and you could, you could fly. Uh, That's right. right. I, I just had a ball with this. It works for me, I think, on every level. I, I don't, I genuinely, for the life of me, don't understand the negative criticism around this because you're going into an animated movie based on the Super Mario Brothers franchise. What the hell were you expecting? Yeah. I mean, it's like going into a Fast and Furious movie and thinking Shakespeare. Like, it's just idiotic. Like, c come on, guys. Like, I love you all, but get a life. Anyway, like I say, there's Mario Kart's in there. There's Seth Rogen as Donkey Kong. There's Jack Black as Bowser. Uh, Anya Taylor-Joy is a blast as Princess Peach, Toadstool, whatever she is. And I think she is Toadstool in this. Um, I, I just, I thought this was really, really fun. It's got the energy. It's got the charm. It's got the cutesy appeal. It's got Luma, a scene-stealing star from Super Mario Galaxy, which is not a game I've ever played because I didn't have that particular one. But there's a... There's this little cutesy star who just says, we're all going to die, and things like that. It's, it's like at times it's got quite a dark sense of humour, but it is, it's obscenely child-friendly. There's no sharp edges to this, but there is a dark sensibility, and I really appreciate that about this. Uh, I will also say, there is a post credit scene. Now, we actually skipped the post credit scene, so you can thank TikTok for, uh, for me having seen it, because... It's 2023, so of course the post credit scene was on TikTok within about 10 seconds. Also happened with John Wick, incidentally. Yeah. Um, 
yeah, I just, having gone through the first attempt at this, I was, and, and I was there opening day in 1993 for Super Mario Brothers with Bob Hoskins and John Leguizamo, AKA Johnny Legs, who incidentally is in the John Wick franchise. Um, I was there opening day with my dad. And I still, to this day, feel the need to apologize to my dad for putting him through that. Because <laughs> I've never I mean, seen it. I I don't think I could love my own son enough to sit through Super Mario Brothers 1993. I, I don't think I would. I don't think I'd love my child enough. I think there's a point about halfway through that movie, I just throw my hands up and say, you're on your own, kid. I'll meet you in the lobby. And I just find me <laughs> chain-smoking outside. It's like, what was that? You know, because it, it's a terrible movie. Like, there's no two ways around that one. This, apology accepted. All is forgiven, Nintendo. Take a bow. Just do, so, do a lap. Do a, Yeah, take a bowser, yeah. Do a lap. You've earned it. You could feel free to do a Zelda movie now. Do whatever you want. Build towards your Avengers style Super Smash Brothers franchise if you would like. This is so good and went down so gangbusters at Askering, like with kids, with, you know, with, with the parents. Just went down so gangbusters that I very firmly believe, as well, you know, factoring in the money it's made, etc. It was 35 million so far. It's been out for like a day. Um, it's got such huge appeal that I don't think we're ever going to be rid of animated Mario now. I think this is now going to be an entire, like, ongoing part of the existence of this brand. Like, I know we've had Mario cartoons over the years. I'm, I was always quite partial to the Super Mario World cartoon back in 1989, 1990, I think it was. Yeah. It's a time with the, 1990s, it tied in with the release of the SNES. And if I don't get the release of the SNES right, someone I know is going to put a gun to my head after this week. So... I would say as well, going with the animated shows, this movie literally opens with them performing the actual theme song to the original. We're the Mario Brothers, and we're here. That, that whole thing. Remember the old uh, Captain Lou Albino? Super Mario Brothers Super Show. That's the one. Yeah, the actual yeah, Mario yeah. Brothers theme song. They perform it. That's the start of the movie, do. is it? Yeah. And, Brilliant. Start, I'm sort of like, and I'm sort of thinking, okay, congratulations. You've earned my money. Well done. Well done, Nintendo. Well done, Illumination. Like, everybody involved hats off job well done people let's all go home call it a day we've all done well yeah brilliant five stars for, well, i mean it's a five star time it's a four star movie because pratt ruins the hell out of it but the rest of the cast is so uniformly fun particularly the likes like jack black seth rogan nanya taylor joy and to an extent charlie day as well that that's it i just have to call it a win again don't understand the, the other reviews you know but i i have to blame that on maybe they just all had miserable childhoods well, I, you know, I couldn't give a flying fig roll about the storyline to this. The point is, it sounds like a huge throwback, reminiscing, like you say, sound effects and all the fun stuff that goes with everything that's going to take me back to being 10 years old again. I'm in. I will also say, because this is a universal movie, we know for a fact that this will be on streaming in 31 days. So 31 days from Wednesday the 5th, this will be on streaming. And you know when it is? There are parents the world over who are going to be sick of the sight of this movie because it is going to be replayed so much. Your son is going to put this on a loop. <laughs> yeah, I, I might have to get a TV for his bedroom then. <laughs> that will solve that one. Uh, Super Mario Brothers movie in cinemas from today if you want to go and enjoy that movie. All right, we've got one more brand new movie to talk about in a moment, Operation Fortune, and Van is going to let us know what he thought of it in just a second. Stay right where you are. Hello and welcome back for one last movie for us to talk about. Um, now it's Operation Fortune, Ruse de Guerre. Oh, we well, tried it. French accent on there, you see. Um, I'm assuming it's French. Um, yeah, what was it? What was it like? Just, just for the sake of the audience at home right now, it's important to note that Adam was not even attempting to say this subtitle <laughs> until we were off mic, and I called him on and said, "It's called Ruse de Guerre." Yeah, and, and, yeah. and ne ne now he's showing off like he knew. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just thought I'd put a little French spin on it, you know. Right. Yeah. Operation Fortune, which is allegedly, I think, meant to be the start of a franchise by Guy Ritchie, and it's an. Oh. I franchise that stars Jason Statham as a secret agent named Orson Fortune. Of course it does. Yes, he is Orson Fortune. You remember when we were joking last week about how the Texas movie wasn't about Taron Edgerton playing Jeff Tetra? Yeah. 
you know, who had to put the bricks. Yeah, nothing like this is the same kind of logic. He's awesome fortune in Operation Fortune. <laughs> the idea here. You've got an elite spy unit that is overseen by Kerry Elways from the Princess Bride and Robin Hood Men in Tights. He's the sort of M of the unit. And, uh, you know, Orson is his bond. There is a Q who's played by Aubrey Plaza. There is a sort of uh, action guy, uh, Nathan, who's just got this wonderfully broad uh, cockney twang. I think you'll hear him in the clip. You know, you won't hear him in the clip. Sorry, he's in the trailer, not the clip. Um, and they are tasked with uh, tracing a stolen item on the black market that they don't quite know the function of. They just know that for the amount of money being offered for it, it's probably going to involve the end of the world. That's literally the mission. However, the person that they think is going to buy this is a billionaire, played by Hugh Grant, in full gentleman mode. So, Hugh Grant, two weeks in a row, last week he was doing... <laughs> He's doing his Paddington 2 character in, in yeah. Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah, Paddington 2 in Dungeons and Dragons. It's his gentleman character in this one. Where is that? Oh, go on. Go on. Please. That, that I love that character as well. That's what he's doing here, but he's rich. He's a billionaire. However, he has one weakness, and this is the only way they can find get into his operation. He's a very big fanboy of this Hollywood star, played by Josh Hartnett. So, they go, get Josh Hartnett, threaten him, blackmail him, and force him to go undercover for them. So they've got a movie star as himself as an undercover agent. And they have to literally, you know, wig in his ear, feeding him lines. Aubrey Plaza goes in as his sort of fictitious girlfriend. Meanwhile, they're working behind the scenes to infiltrate his operation with the literal fate of the world at stake. You can hear you can hear Orson and his would-be Q having it out with said movie star right here. Turns out everyone thinks you're a superstar, Danny. Once they heard you were in town, they came to us. <laughs> Stop. <coughs> I don't think I could do this. No, no, no. Danny? Nope. Danny. Trust yourself. No need to be nervous. No reason to be nervous. They're only killers. We've all seen you handle killers before, on screen. Fundamentally, there's no difference. What do you think an agent does? They act. And no one acts better than you, Danny. The best agents are stars, and the best actors are movie stars. I guess that's sort of true. You're an actor. Act. I must just say, the start of that clip sounded like the start of All Things Bright and Beautiful. I don't know if you picked <laughs> up on that, which threw me a little bit. Um, so, yeah, uh, it sounds, this sounds great, actually. And like, I love Hugh Grant's character. I love that character he plays. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I think this would be something I'd be into, actually. I think you would. And I'd be fair, this is quite a pedestrian film. As a film in its own right, you, you've seen this done to death. And if yeah. you would, <clears throat> if you would like to see a better alternative to this, it already exists with the same actor. So, if you would like an action comedy spy thriller with Jason Statham absolutely owning it, go and seek out Paul Feig's, I think, 2016, 2015 movie, Spy, starring Melissa McCarthy, in which Jason Statham turns up and absolutely owns the show. Here, he's a bit more watered down. Like, you, you I mean, don't get me wrong, the cast are owning it. The cast own the movie. However, they're owning quite a pedestrian by the numbers movie. They are the best thing about it. Like you said, I mean, like the way you reacted to Hugh Grant doing his character from the gentleman in mm -hmm. this. Yeah. If that works for you, you're you're in good stead. You like Statham, you're in good stead, because you know, when is Statham not a good time? And just so good to see Aubrey Plaza actually getting a meaty mainstream film role. However, I say mainstream, this is kind of being dumped onto Prime Video today. It was, I think it was a limited theatrical in the US. I don't know why this is the second Guy Ritchie movie in a row, starring Jason Statham, no less, that has gone to Prime Video in the UK, because we had this with Wrath of Man last year, his uh, his remake of, of Wrath of Man, which I, I couldn't, I didn't like that movie very much, but I still thought, why are we doing this with a Guy Ritchie movie? It just seems kind of strange, like Guy Ritchie's He's Guy Ritchie. It's like, you know, you wouldn't do it to Tarantino. Why would you do it to Guy Ritchie? But yeah. uh, having said that, streaming is absolutely where this film belongs. Uh, you you do feel like if you saw this theatrically, you'd pay the ticket. But you would kind of feel shortchanged. You would maybe give it the free pass based 
on how good the cast are. And fair play for that. But I think on streaming, you're going to have far fewer quibbles with it. Like I say, it's very by the numbers. It's very pedestrian. But well, they make it they make it fun. There are some decent gags here and there. Statham's laissez-faire attitude as a spy is exactly what you would expect it would be. You know, His, his whole function in the movie is just to get drunk. Like that that's his thing. They keep making reference to the fact that he keeps bankrupting the British government by just buying expensive bottles of wine. That's a thing that he just gets on this ludicrous seven four seven just loads up on like, you know, thirty year old wine. Um and you know, like I say, when is Statham not a good time? That being said, I just it, Here we it, go. It, again, it does feel overlong. It's an yeah. hour fifty four. There is not the material to sustain it. There really isn't. You've seen better spy action movies in Bond movies in recent years. You've seen better spy comedies in Paul Feig's Spy, most notably. I would maybe throw a shout out for uh, what was that one with Mila Kunis, where it was the boyfriend, where her boyfriend she went on, she got ghosted by her boyfriend. It turned out he was a spy, or something like that. It was like three years ago with Kate McKinnon as her best friend. Oh. Yeah, I can't remember. Hassan Minaj is in it. It's going to drive me mad. But was oh, it called I... something like Spy or something quite? The simple? Spy Who Dumped Me. It was called yeah, The Spy Who Dumped Me. I think The Spy Who Dumped Me was actually a better movie than this, and that was a very forgettable movie that just didn't have that likable a cast. However, Paul Feig's Spy, I think, is an infinitely better movie than this, and does feature Jason Statham doing the same shtick, better but with less screen time, which is a Really weird thing to say. So it's on the right platform. It's on Prime Video. You can watch it from today. You can watch it right now. So I, you know, I should, I recommend it. Like just for the cast, just for the, you know, for the enjoyment of that cast. Do not watch a trailer though, because for some ungodly reason, I mean, the trailer has been around for a good long while. Um, the trailer does give away every beat. Oh, I no, hate it when they do that. Yeah, there's no surprise in this whatsoever. Every <sighs> Every single beat of this movie's plot has been telegraphed in the trailer. And if you watch it and you even know the, the basis of narrative movie construction, then, you know, you can you can piece this one together pretty easily. So avoid any marketing materials you can. So that's Operation Fortune Ruse de Guerre, which is on Prime Video right now. Rated R, or rated 15 in this case. Okay, right. Well, um, we have got some more new movies coming out next week. Of course, we'll be here to talk about. Um, so, uh, again, I don't really know much of any of these. So, we're looking at Renfield next week. Oh, I mean, that's the biggie next week is Renfield. Like, right? I've not the, even the seen big... the trailer for that. Ah, well, I mean, I have several times. The, the the big thing, the big reason to see Renfield is Nicolas Cage is going to play Dracula, oh. which is, I'm sorry, the medium of cinema has peaked. It has. Yeah. Like, just, just call it, shut down the industry. We're done. Like, once Nicolas Cage... I mean, he did a Western recently. Like, that was more of a bucket list thing, I think. It was a terrible movie. But once Nicolas Cage has played Dracula, why are we bothering? We've, we've, we've completed it, mate. You know what I mean? Like, it's, it's over. So that's next week with uh, Nicholas Holt as the, uh, the, the titular character. Assassin Club with Henry Golding is next week. Now, I don't know of any press shows for that. It's a Paramount movie, so I don't imagine I'm seeing it. Uh, the Curse of Rosalie is out next week. Cairo Conspiracy sounds quite interesting next week as well. Uh, One Fine Morning and the drama, sorry, the documentary, I believe, Loving Highsmith is next week as well. So it's going to be quite an interesting uh, interesting week, I think. You know, We're getting to that point now. We're starting with the summer movies. We are mere... We're like a month away from things like The Little Mermaid and, and The Fast and Furious and The Guardians of the Galaxy to start coming out. So we're going to start getting into a like, regular blockless territory in about a month. Yeah, best time of, best time of the year for the good Oh, movies. yeah. Yay. Sod Oscar uh, season. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, um, we'll have all of those to look at next week. Uh, until then, I've been Adam Ball. I've been Van Connor, and we shall return.